welcome everybody. It's lovely to see everybody joining uh, the session. And while we're waiting for everyone to join us, it would be really, really wonderful if you let us know where you're joining from. I'm Anita Taylor. I'm here on behalf of Drawing Projects UK. We're hosting this wonderful drawing discussion drawn from ice, a conversation between art and alpine archaeology this evening. And it's just really fantastic to see everybody gathering. So it's great to see James from Seattle, David from Oxford, Handatsa from Leeds, three from Dundee, lovely to see you, um, from Wales, uh, Somerset, North Wales, South Wales, Princeton, um, joining from Bristol, from very foggy Oxford. It's very foggy in both Scotland and Wiltshire, which is how during our guests are panned out from the UK, and I'm not sure what the weather is in Bern, um, but probably much the same. So it seems that the cloud has come down. So great to see people joining from Wiltshire, from Bath, from Falkland, Essex, from Staplehurst in Kent, Cookham, from the Black Isle in Scotland, lovely to see you, uh, Hampshire. So it's foggy everywhere, isn't it? <laughs> Another person from Princeton, that's lovely to see you, welcome. Um, hello from Dorset, from Clare, Penny from Exeter. Really well, really lovely to see you all joining. We've got quite a full booking, so it is very nice to see where everyone's joining from uh, as we settle in and we'll introduce the session properly at five past six. So if you want to settle in and get a cup of tea, glass of wine, some water, wherever, whatever it is that you'd like to have a comfortable, relaxed session being inspired by our wonderful speakers this evening. Um, please do um, settle in and get ready. Um, but please keep telling us where you're joining from. <laughs> it's foggy near Bath indeed. Um, so we're deep in winter in the UK. It's arrived quite quickly after very unseasonal uh, warmth and mildness. Uh, but really great to see everybody joining. There are a few more people coming into the waiting room. So we will wait a couple more minutes uh, before we introduce the chair for the evening. How are we doing, Fiona? Ready to go? I think we're ready to go, which is brilliant. So I'm hoping that um, a few more people will join, but Fiona will keep an eye on the waiting room um, and let people in. I know that some people, we've had some messages to say some people have got caught up in traffic um, on their way. So there may be some late joiners. So can I say the warmest of welcomes? It's really wonderful to have uh, a wonderful audience this evening and I know that people are joining from across the world uh, and across the UK. I'm Anita Taylor, I'm um, the director of founding director of Drawing Projects UK and also the Dean of Duncan of Jordanston uh, College of Art and Design at the University of Dundee. But I'm here on behalf of Drawing Projects UK this evening um, where we're hosting a wonderful exhibition, Emergency by Sarah Casey. And this drawing discussion is one of a series held in association with the exhibition um, to discuss and introduce all sorts of ideas that underpin the research and underpin Sarah's wonderful work. This evening's uh, event, as you'll see on screen, includes um, two wonderful Alpine archaeologists, but Jerry will introduce them properly in a moment. Um, and Sarah, but I'm going to hand over to Jerry Davies, who's going to chair the event this evening. And we're really thrilled that Jerry is convening the session. We're really thrilled to welcome Sarah, Marcel, and Regular. 
Um, but Jerry is a really distinguished artist. He's senior lecturer in drawing at Lancaster University, and he's also the co-author of a very wonderful book, Drawing Investigations, uh, co-written with Sarah Casey. Um, and Drawing Investigations looked at graphic relationships with science, culture, and environment. So you can see that there's a, a serious underpinning. Jerry's own work deals with climate change and different aspects um, of the environment and all sorts of other content. But we also presented Jerry's work, Flood Story, at Drawing Projects UK in 2017. So while Jerry would like to be introduced as an artist with a burnt stick talking about drawing, um, we're really thrilled to introduce a really astonishing artist, academic and writer to convene the evening. So thank you, Jerry, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. Could you say all that again, especially the wonderful things? Um, but no, seriously, I'm very pleased to be here. And as Anita has said, my own interest in drawing uh, where it is interdisciplinary with other subjects. Uh, and also where drawing takes a public purpose. Um, so it, it gives me great pleasure um, to be here today and to introduce uh, Sarah Regular and, and Marcel. And, and it's with Marcel that I'll begin an introduction. Um, Marcel Cornelison is a uh, archeologist and project director of the Burgess project, the Mountain Ice Project at the Institute of Cultures of the Alps in Altdorf in the Swiss Alps. Uh, and Marcel uh, studied um, in Amsterdam at the University of the Arts and at the University of Leicester and the University of Reading in the UK. Um, and his interest are in the um, prehistory of the Alps, the early Holocene and hunter, gatherer, Fisher societies in Central Western Europe, especially in Alpine environments. The Burgess Mountain Ice Research examines rock crystal extraction sites at the Fokala da Stremsut. Sorry about my pronunciation there, uh, Marcel. And this research project examines rock crystal extraction um, at, at, at heights of um, 2,817 meters above sea level. And these are sites which until 2013 were covered by glacial ice since retreated possibly to do with climate change. So Marcel is really interested in cultures of extraction and the use of these rock crystals by Mesolithic hunter gatherers. Uh, also looking at this work alongside um, climate, prehistoric climate change, and also current environmental change and, and land, land use. Also, Marcel was one of uh, a group of archaeologists who joined Sarah at the outflow of the Glacier Mormine um, for a day of discussion uh, and experimentation, and kindly brought along a drone to film Sarah's um, drawings laid out on the ice. Um, and this is really important documentation because one of Sarah's objects um, for this experimentation was to allow the drawings, drawings of glacial artifacts to, to themselves melt um, in the ice. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Regula too. Uh, Regula Guber is an archeologist and project director for the archaeological service of the canton of Bern in Switzerland. And regular trained at the University of Reading in the UK. And after field work in England, Scotland, Jordan, and Egypt, her focus is now on the Alps and glacial archaeology. Alongside looking after all of the archaeology in the canton, she is responsible for monitoring of alpine ice patches and glaciers, including Neolithic archaeology and also more recent finds that are emerging. Regulus work from two ice patches, the Schneedejok and the Locking Pass, show people used alpine passes throughout the history and from as early as the fifth millennium BC. Regular two joined Sarah at the Glacier Montmine for discussion and experimentation 
And in a really generous and important move, she facilitated Sarah's visit to the Canton of Bern's archeological research and storage facility, where Sarah drew objects, including the bows from the Schneider Yacht Pass, which feature in Sarah's exhibition. So um, I'm not sure Sarah needs that much introduction, but here goes. So we've come to see Sarah's uh, exhibition um, and to hear about um, her project. For those who don't know, Sarah is senior lecturer in uh, drawing and installation and head of the School of Art at Lancaster University. Sarah trained at Leeds University in art history and the philosophy of science and then at Lancaster for her fine art masters and then her PhD. As I say, her specialism is in drawing and installation and her topics have included exploration of historic clothing, costume and dress. Notably the Royal Collections at Kensington Palace and more recently examination and transformation of images of Ruskin's clothes transforming them into, into large scale drawings. And these were exhibited at Brantwood, Ruskin's House and Museum for the Ruskin Centenary. The current project, as I'm sure Sarah will explain, arises from thinking of clothing and artifacts as traces of human presence, and also arises around concerns of environmental change. And, and the frail future of artifacts. So with no more ado, um, I'll pass over to Marcel, who will start today's um, talk with um, a presentation on glacial archeology span in the landscape. And then he'll move on and pass over to Regula, who'll talk a little bit more on this subject and perhaps more on finds in the landscape. So that's it from me for the moment. Over to you, Marcel. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I think you can hear me now. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your introduction, Jerry. Thank you for uh, drawing Projects UK to, to uh, invite us to talk with Sarah about all of this. Um, hello from Bern, where, yes, the weather is also very old to me, and dark and grey. Um, we'll have some photos that uh, allow us to dream away a bit um, to more summary or less summary uh, days uh, in the Alps. Um, the Alps are um, a big landscape. It doesn't always look so big when you look at the map, but it's, it's a big landscape with... Uh, but it's changing lands. It's a changing landscape as well. It, it has always changed. Uh, on the slide here, you um, you see a, a a graph with uh, glacial uh, variations over the last thirteen thousand years. So that's pretty much since the last uh, um, last ice age. And uh, well, I don't really want to go into detail. I just really wanted to show you quickly that, yes, there is fluctuations in climate and also uh, glacials that uh, extend and that retreat um, throughout the Holocene. And I also wanted to show you quickly a very general chronology of the Mesolithic, the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, just so that all the non-archaeologists among us uh, know what we're talking about. So the Mesolithic starts really at the beginning of the Holocene, uh, here in Switzerland at least, um, about nine and a half thousand BC, and lasts till about five and a half thousand BC. Then we have two and a half thousand years of uh, Neolithic until the Bronze Age comes, after which comes the Iron Age and the Roman times. And yeah, we hope that you're a little bit familiar with that. And if not, uh, ask us questions later on about this. With that, I think we can move on to the next slide. Well, I mentioned the, the changing landscape and, and the, the changes in climate that we've seen over the past thousands of years. 
And if you look at these maps, this is uh, near Grindelwald in, in Switzerland, if anyone has ever been. And it is a uh, left, you see a map from 1870 of the lower Grindelwald glacier, the Unter Grindelwald glacier. And you see how it uh, extends all the way to the left hand top corner. It was even so it extended so much in the, the little ice age. There was a cold snap that was uh, that took place between 1300 and about 1900 that it almost um, extended into the village of Klindelwald. And if you look at the map on the right, you see that there is now a lake. The glacier is uh, moved back to just about where it says Sessenberg in the red circle. The Sessenberg was an Alp. Um, I think I'll wait with that. Um, so roughly remember this, we move on to the next slide, which shows you very much in a very dramatic fashion what it looks like. We're looking now um, out towards Grindelwald. So we're looking from that red dot that we saw on the map, the red circle, towards the north, over the water. And you see those lines, the, the brown lines with all the, um, the stones and the, the debris. The top of that, where the grass grows now, that's where the glacier was around 1870 at the highest point. All of that below has melted away. And uh, on the right, you see these uh, uh, two gentlemen and the lady they're standing. They are standing on an alp. An alp is a, uh, a field where uh, animals are grazed in the mountains in summer. So there's a, 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 a vertical pastoralism that happens in the in the Swiss Alps, um, and people would graze their animals, in this case sheep, on this piece of land. And if we move on to the next slide, I don't know if that's still relevant, actually. No, but that doesn't matter. Uh, People used to be able to cross at that line where where we saw the brown from the green, the separation, that's where the glacier was. They could move across um, with the animals to the other side. Nowadays, of course, it's very difficult. And it looks like uh, there is still uh, a herdsman who brings his sheep across most summers, but it looks like he might have to stop now because it's just impossible to get there with the animals. So we're talking about glaciers. Um, I've shown you this picture. This is a picture of the Brunifian Glacier in central Switzerland. And this is what one thinks of when one hears the word glacier, a big expand of ice. Um, you can sort of see how, how it moves towards us. A, a glacier, um, most glaciers move. They are not stuck to the ground. There is glaciers that are stuck to the ground, but most glaciers don't, uh, are not stuck to the ground and they move slowly with gravity. Um, like a very, very slow river. In contrast to what we see on the next slide, and on the next slide, we um, see, can I have the next slide, please? Yes, thank you. You, you see here um, a person walking on, on a Fielenfeld in German or an ice patch. This is a, um, I think it's also called a nave field in English. Um, these are little fields of ice, um, in this case now covered with, with last winter snow still, that are stable. They often lay in, lie in, in little, little dollops in the, con in the, in the landscape. And, um, uh, when we talk about glacial archaeology, we actually often mean glacial and ice field archaeology or ice patch archaeology, because a lot of the finds that we make as archaeologists are actually not made in glaciers because the glaciers move. And when the glaciers move, they, uh, there's a lot of forces that come with that. There's a lot of ice, there's huge masses of ice, and they mangle the finds. They mangle whatever is, is being dropped onto it gets moved into the ice and it gets spat out again at the bottom. Um, in ice patches, that doesn't happen. They are stable and whatever melts, uh, whatever fr freezes into the ice 
melts out again, pretty much in the same place. At the, this is uh, the Schneedioch. Uh, Regla will talk more about that as well. In the back, you see another glacier. That's the, the Wildhorn Gletscher. Um, we're in the Bernese Oberland here. Uh, next slide, please. I think the slides are a bit slow. They seem to be a bit big. Huh? I'll uh, continue anyway. Um, finds that we make are most often uh, ah, sorry, this is another ice patch. Sorry, uh, I know it doesn't look like another ice patch, but um, it's the ice patch near the Lutcher Pass. Uh, it's a beautiful place. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite easily to reach. Quite easy to reach. It's a good. It's a good trip once. Um, it's beautiful geology as well with all these different stones. And you see here in the middle, you see a um, a patch of water here. This is where the ice patch used to be. Now it uh, it tends to melt away almost every summer. Sometimes there's snow that lasts a few winters. Could I have the next slide, please? And um, here uh, it's another site that Regula works on. And it's also in the Bernese Oberland. It's between the Valle and and the Bernese Oberland. Uh, sometimes the snow doesn't melt in summer, and then it's harder to get to the fight you the finds the archaeology the archaeology that you might want to record which is uh, uh visible here in, uh, in the summer i think of 14 when a team of archaeologists including regular did a heroic attempt to uh yeah remove all the snow that was still there and i think they didn't really get to it in the end but that summer next slide please but, so the finds that we have uh, in, in glacial archaeology, they're really interesting because of two reasons. First of all, we just don't have a lot of archaeological sites. We don't know much about the prehistory, especially of the Alps. There is just not a lot that we know. So any site that we get is an interesting site. There's also the fact that in the ice, organic material is being reserved. And this is material that we don't normally find. This is leather, like this bit of shoe that we see on this slide here. And uh, it's it's uh, regular is going to show a bit more. It's uh, it's fibers, it's textiles, it's bone, it's wood. However, the permafrost, the the permanently frozen ground, can also protect and 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 conserve finds over the years or objects over the years, over many, many years, like is the case here. Next slide, please. And uh, yeah, other another piece of shoe, also prehistoric, uh, that has actually come out of the ice. I think this is on the Schneedioch. But once again, Regla will talk more about that. Can we move on, please, to the next slide? Here we have a map. And these are the most important glacial archaeological sites in the Swiss Alps. And we've already talked about the Schneedioch and the Lutcher Pass that you see between the Bernese Alps and the Alps of the Valle. And I will talk as well about the Untere Streemlücke or uh, Furchtkladerstreem Sud, as uh, that's the Romance name that uh, Jerry used before. Next slide, please. Which is a bit more in central Switzerland. Now the site I work on is a bit different because it is actually a. It's not just single objects that were lost or dropped or on the ice got frozen into the ice and are melting out. This is actually a site that was um, covered by the glacier for a long time. So it, it was there, the glacier grew over it and then um, covered it for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, it's a, it's a, a quartz vein that a crystal hunter in the region, uh, the, the region where this is in central Switzerland is very famous for its rock crystal and other minerals. And these mineral hunters, these crystal hunters, is still a, a very 
lively tradition is still done by a lot of people there. There was a crystal hunter that was looking for, for new sites, new veins, and he found that, that white quartz band that you see underneath uh, Olivia or behind Olivia's feet there. She's the archaeologist there with the purple trousers. And um, he, uh, he found that cave there, which was then not really a cave when he found it. As you can see on the right hand photo, it's, it's quite a lot smaller than it is now. Um, he found uh, bits of, uh, like, as he said, a heap of, of crystal shirts and pieces of antler and wood. These antler, this piece of antler um, and the wood turned out to be 6,000, uh, 8,000 years old. So that's another two and a half thousand years, 3,000 years, almost older than an Utsi that you might know. Um, we're then dealing here with, with uh, they were left, these pieces of wood and the antler, by Mesolithic hunter-gatherers, so uh, mobile people without agriculture that moved around in the landscape, including the Alps, apparently. And um, that was a big surprise for us. We never thought that we would have such old finds uh, preserved by ice in the Alps. And uh, in 2020, we were able to excavate a part of the site there. Can we move on to the next slide, please? And you might remember that we saw at the very beginning this beautiful sunset uh, photo of a glacier that uh, this site is at the horizon of that photo that we looked at. And uh, yeah, here we you see how we work. We, we collected a lot of material. In the end, we took um, a thousand kilos of, uh, of material along. The finds from this period are very, very small, so we pretty much uh, collected all the sediment that we took along and then uh, sifted, uh, wet sifted uh, down in the valley. Can we move on please to the next slide? Here is the, the piece of antler that uh, got us so excited and the pieces of wood um, dating to just about six, just before 6000 um, BC. And it's really nice as an archaeologist that you just don't have one find, but you have three finds that really uh, date so close together. Can we move on, please? It's a red deer antler, by the way. And a lot of the finds that we find are stones, so that's a bit untypical for many of the glacial archaeology sites. Um, but uh, that's what these people use, and of course, that's what preserves as well, very well, even if it isn't frozen. There was, by the way, another piece of antler that uh, the crystal hunter found, but that actually um, disintegrated when it thawed up. After the site, uh, after the excavation, we, we wet sieve everything. And then, of course, there's all the, the studies with the scientific drawings, not anything like Saga makes, and um, photos. And for more different kind of finds, I think, uh, Regula can tell you more about that, and she'll follow on from me from here. Oh, yes, I'll talk a bit more about what we find, actually. I thought I'd start with the, um, the most famous glacial find in archaeology. That's the Ötzi or Iceman from uh, the Tisenjörg, that's on the border between Austria and Italy. He died about 3000 BCE and was found in 1991. You see on the right, you see a reconstruction of what he could have looked like. I think that's the most recent one. But he's not the only person that was found in the ice. Next slide. Um, there's actually in the 1980s already, a woman was found on the Portobello Glacier, which is in Eastern Switzerland. She must have fallen into a crevasse in the 1690s. You see, she now, Marcel mentioned about the glaciers that they move and that's exactly why she was found in quite a few fragments you see on the right basically which bones were preserved and found on the glacier as well as the very small fragments of her clothes. It is interesting especially because she's actually a woman which is not what you expect. She's wearing a man's coat, she's wearing a felt hat, I'm sorry it's all in German. Uh, she's wearing two shoes and she wearing two different shoes in two different sizes. So she probably was not very rich and why she was on the glacier is not clear. She might have just, might have been the fastest way across to the next valley. 
Next slide. Another person that was found on a glacier is um, the Theodule Glacier in the Valais. That's, um, he used to be called the mercenary because he had so many weapons with him. I think Sarah drew quite a few objects of his. Uh, the latest um, research research suggests more that he might have been a trader, quite rich trader, because he has quite a lot of money with him and um, a high status dagger, etc. But we find also much older stuff. Next slide. But then we don't normally have a, a body to go with it. But for us archaeologists, it's also just interesting to see what people carried around with them in the Alps. So this is one of our oldest finds from the Schneiderjoch pass. It's a lime bast fiber. Um, it's a bag, we think. You see on the right what it looks like when you find it, when it's just melted out of the ice. That was probably out of the ice for a few days before we found it. Um, we took it with us in a lump, including the rocks underneath. So there was about a 10 kilo lump of rocks with the uh, fibers on top. And then it gets um, preserved for took about half a year to um, make an, a carrying structure underneath and then turn it and then take the stones away and then turn it back on its side and then actually preserve the fibers. Fibers are um, very delicate. And while a piece of wood, if it breaks, you can glue it. It's all right. It's not too bad for the conservation. Um, these fibers, once they break, you have no chance to know what goes with what. And at the bottom, I have a picture of a Japanese basket. I think it, what we have is very similar. Maybe you see in the middle of the picture, you see sort of a, a thicker cord, which we think is the edge of the, the top of the, of the bag. And this is um, 4,200 BCE. This is really early Neolithic for us in Switzerland. We don't have a lot, especially on the north side of the Alps. Um, most things only start about then. And we have a big hole between the Mesolithic, about 5,000 and then 4,200. So it's a time where we have very little um, material anyway, and then organic material even less. And I think this is probably a unique bag. We haven't really been able to study it yet in depth because it only was found in 2020 and conservation takes a while and then we don't always have instantly time to do the scientific analysis as well. Next slide. Now the bow that um, Jerry already mentioned from the Schneiderjoch, you see here a photo, um, you see a detail on the right because the whole thing is just not really easy to photograph. It's too long, it's a meter 60 long. And we have about at least five arrows that probably go with it. So they're the same date. They're all C14 dated. Um, we also have the, a case for the bow. You see the, um, it's a might have birch barge. You see a reconstruction and the actual object. The object is still frozen because um, it was found in 2005, four, four, four or five. Um, and it's been frozen since because nobody had because my colleague had the first to basically a PhD to find out how to we were how to treat birch bark that comes out of the ice because nobody had found it so far so there was no clear how to preserve it. She's just finished her PhD so she'll start next year doing the preservation of it. Uh, it's a unique object. We have no comparable material. It's really made to protect the bow so it's not a quiver. It's not to keep the arrows safe. It's really to keep the actual bow safe. And birch bark, the way it's made, this with those two layers basically protects it from water, humidity, and dirt when you carry it around the Alps. Um, next slide. The early Bronze Age, we have another nice object that fits on the right from the Schneiderjoch, and then we have an exactly same box from the Lötchen Pass, both from the same time, early Bronze Age, about 1800 BC. Um, they're made the same way. They used the same materials. Uh, we found them maybe five years apart, and we have no comparable finds. So in the lakeside villages where we have a bit of preservation of wood from the same time, they make the boxes out of bark and not out of actual split wood. Because what they use here is basically split wood boards. And they sew the thing together with um, uh, stone pine branches. It's amazing. We've tried to make one. It's not that easy, we noticed. 
<laughs> and on the left, you see also remains of the actual content of the box. So this little black lump in the middle of the box, this is the bottom of the box, is um, cereal grains and coarsely, it's a pretty coarse flour. Um, yeah, next slide. Sometimes it's easy to see what you have. So with these shoes from the Theodul Pass again, as that mercenary or a not mercenary from the Theodul Pass, you see these shoes from about 1600. Um, it's quite easy to reconstruct what it is. This is quite interesting. The man actually had two pairs of shoes with him. One was smaller than the other. You see the bottom one has slits in it. That's actually a smaller pair of shoes. One interpretation is that he had a spare pair of shoes with him because, of course, you get wet feet on the glacier. Uh, maybe they were a bit too small, so he cut them open, that they could walk with them. On the left, you see a piece of uh, shoe leather from the Lutchen Pass, which has been C14 dated to 1000 AD. Um, next slide. And then we come to the picture that Marcel already showed you, that um, that shoe fragment, and you see on the right what it looks like when you have all the fragments and you laid them out properly. Um, these are early Bronze Age again, so about 1800 BC. And at the bottom right, you have left, you have a reconstruction of what that shoe might have looked like. We have also an even older shoe, where I don't have a good photo of, sadly. But um, so you see, we have a lot of leather. We have also fragments of trousers from the Schneiderjoch. We have a fragment of a coat from up there. In the Lutchen Pass, we also have fragments of um, buttons, so made of horn. We see all sorts of little organic materials and gives you a really an idea of how people might have moved around the Alps. Next slide. And I thought maybe I have to show you a bit what those two passes look like. So this is the Schnitterjoch Pass. You see on the right of the picture, you see the, part, the actual pass. And it's typical for both the Lutchen Pass and the Schnitterjoch that they're on the north side of the pass, just about 20, 50 height meters below the actual pass. Where the um, where it's less windy, it's less cold. It's really where you, if it's a windy day, you really want to have a rest down there, not on top of the pass. That is really noticeable when, when you work up there. That really makes a difference. And you see also the two ice patches from the Schneiderjoch. So the bottom one is still an ice patch. You see on the left the big ice patch. On the right, you see a, a top of the you're on top of the path that you probably see is a little snow patch now that used to be an ice patch as well. And the finds come from those two ice patches. We now go up there every year to have a look at the actual path. Next slide. But the thing is that we basically, uh, the ice patch has gone as of 2020. Last remains were there in 2019. You see what the ice patch looked like, the lower one in 2006, the two Arrows on each photo show you the same rocks, so to give a bit of an orientation of what it looks like, it's not exactly the same size, the photos, but you see what the, what happened to the ice patch. And you see as well how we work at the, there when we are up there. Um, we measure everything in. We have um, fixed points that we measure things in from because you don't really have a good GPS re um, reception up there. We photograph everything. We make a sketch. We try to um, take things as carefully as possible with us. Next slide. This is the Lutchen Pass to give you an idea what that looks like. You see on the right photo, you see a little white patch of snow in the middle. That's where the actual site is. The, on the glacier, we also have not found anything yet. We do keep, have an eye, we keep an eye on it, but so far we have only had one medieval hiking stick. Um, you see on the left what it looked like up there in summer 1926, what the difference is to today. This ice patch that we now have there that melts occasionally away. The hut warden, the hut is really nearby, he says, and he's been up there for 40 years, and the hut warden says it's, it's melted out the first time, 2011. Like that it really melted, gone completely. That's also when we have the first finds from there. Next slide. Here you see a year when there actually still was, again, snow. I think there might have been two or three years where the snow didn't go away. It's very, it's interesting. It doesn't just, I mean, a hot summer is not good, but it also depends on the winter. It depends how much snow there was. It depends how the snow was deposited by the wind. And then it depends if it 
if the summer is wet or dry makes a difference as well. It's yeah, and then some sometimes it melts away and sometimes not. And you see again how we work up there. Sometimes we have to draw something as well. Like on the Lurchin Pass, we made a little excavation, like a couple of square meters, because we actually had so much material from there. This is now finished, and what we now do is what we what you see at the bottom with the measuring tape that we basically find single finds and measure those in and describe them. I think that's it. I hope we gave you a bit of an idea of what glacial archaeology looks like in Switzerland. Thank you very much, Regula. Thank you. That was wonderful. I'm sure that will uh, raise many questions. Um, but now we're going to move on to um, Sarah's presentation. And I suppose um, the question that's hanging there really is, what is it, Sarah, that's drawn you to working with glacial archaeology, uh, with artifacts, and 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 into a practice which involves collaboration with archaeologists uh, and perhaps even conservators? So that's my question that's sort of hanging there, and I hope that um, that will be in part answered by your presentation. Okay, so over to you, Sarah. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Jerry. Um... I think that's a very good question. So what was it that drew me to glacial archaeology? And um, yeah, why was I interested in it? Um, so many of you here, I think, have probably heard me talk before. So I'll keep my introduction really short. But maybe a little bit of background information is useful. Um, so as Jerry said at the start, I'm an artist working mainly through drawing. And one of the things that's preoccupied um, my practice for a really long time was about ideas of preservation and this connection between drawing and what it means to preserve something. And I'm particularly interested in this idea of um, how, how the mark in drawing is a form of preserving something, a kind of record. It's a trace of a presence of something was that was there. And it tells the story of something that happens, a trace of an action. And what I'm really interested in as an artist is how that mark can reflect processes or actions that happen in life. So I'll give a couple of examples. Next slide, please. So I've done a lot of work with museum collections um, because I've been fascinated by how objects that come down to us, what comes down to us, what doesn't, what, what's decided to be kept and what isn't. And these kind of politics of preservation and the images on screen now are of an exhibition at the Bose Museum in 2015, where I documented and drew a series of lace caps, which have been kept in the museum stores in, in a suitcase that hadn't gone on display. And it was, it's a good example of how drawing was then able to study these and quite literally in the images you see on screen, um, bring these to light. And next slide, please. Um, another example might, is a project from 2019. This was with the Ryerson Fashion Research Collection in Toronto. And here, these are drawings which are scored into newsprint. Um, so like newspaper, this, which has been soaked in wax. And then the lines of the drawing are just scored into that. And so the newsprint is aging over time. And what the drawings depict is this wedding dress, which has entered the collection, you can just see it in the foreground of the image there. The wedding dress has entered the collection, but really it probably shouldn't have ought to enter the collection. It's, the silk is very fragile, it's falling apart, it's completely disintegrating to the extent that it actually can't really be studied and it can't actually be seen. But nonetheless, this art artifact is being preserved. So why is it being kept? Um, and it's, next, next slide, please. Um, so in some ways, glacial archaeology struck me as taking this thinking around the tension of what gets kept, but maybe not seen, um, and who are we keeping it for? Who is it for? What does it mean in the future? It seemed to me that glacial archaeology almost shines a spotlight in this, taking it into extremes by being a concern not only for a museum, or for a family, but it raises questions about whole communities and is linked to um, current concerns about the planet um, and what is preserved, what do we preserve in this planet and think about the changes that are we're witnessing climatically. Because as regular Marcel kind of pointed out, where the artifacts are really safest 
is in the ice. They're protected and they're preserved for many thousands of years. Um, Marcel mentioned sites which have objects which have been preserved for kind of 8,000 years as well. And the shoes from the Schneidjoch being 4,000 years old. So these are really ancient things which are, are able to be preserved in those arid, um, cold, frozen conditions of the ice. Um, and as soon as they're exposed, they begin to degrade. And that degradation means material loss and the loss of knowledge, which is contained in that material. Um, so it's like they're kind of stored for a future that um, we don't yet know. Um, and while, of course, it's really fantastic that these artifacts are coming to light and archaeologists like Regula and Marcel are able to study them, as they both pointed out, the ice patches are melting and these objects are being lost um, for the future. So they're not necessarily accessible to be stored, they're, they're being lost. And of course, their emergence is happening as a result of a changed planet and changed climate. So why is this relevant to drawing? Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, drawing is at once kind of making a mark which contains information about how it was laid down. Um, the art historian Tony Godfrey's talked about drawing as a kind of archaeology itself, an archaeology of acts of touching. Each mark kind of lays down the trace of an action. Um, um, and thinking about the archaeology itself, these artifacts it's themselves have been marked in multiple ways by the manufacturer. These are man-made made objects um, by the wear of the wearer, the person who wore it, but also of its life in the ice. And so they, they represent this kind of marking which has been made by both the human and the environment. Um, and John Berger, has talked about drawing as a kind of searching of a kind of burying beneath the surface. Again, apparently seemed to talk about drawing as a mean, something which is kind of layered. Um, so it struck me that drawing is a, might be a useful way to think through the past of these objects and translate some of these ideas about them, their, their sense of their apparition at the cost of loss, but also this very fragile presence that they seem to occupy as well. Um, so drawing is kind of part of a way of kind of translating the ideas of these objects, making that material so we can see and experience them. And I'll say a bit about this within the context of actual artifacts and what I've seen. Next slide, please. So I first became interested in glacial archeology span and artifacts in, 2018, when I went to the Valley History Museum in Sion in Switzerland and to see an exhibition called Vestige en Paris, which curated by Pierre-Yves Nicot, who since has been incredibly helpful to me in helping me access um, different archaeological finds and artifacts. And what you see on screen at the moment is my sketchbook of some of the drawings I made on those initial visits. And this, the drawing then was a process of trying to record what it was I was seeing, of coming close to the artifacts, of almost imagining or inhabiting that artifact through the traces of where that I could see on it and using the drawing to record that. Next slide. And I felt that my job as an artist then was trying to translate how I had felt in front of those artifacts into, um, a, if you like, an artwork, a drawing that communicated the sense of tensions that these artifacts embodied, their fragile presence, the sense that they were vulnerable to disappearance, and the sense that they'd kind of emerged from different time periods as well, all out of ice. So what emerged with these um, drawings on wax paper, and these are made by sandwiching graphite dust between layers of wax um, paper, and then sealing these shut. And of course, if these get too hot, they're gonna melt away. Next slide, please. And so the drawings are now exhibited um, hanging. So these are multi-layers of drawings, um, each depicting different artifacts, some of which you might recognize from Marcel and regular slides. So you've got artifacts from different time periods coming together because it might be the case that in one year, it's not necessarily that, like the most recent things are gonna melt out first. 
um, within the ice, it's quite unpredictable what might be found when and where it, it might have come from. So there's a sense of using the layering to layer up a kind of unpredictability. Next slide, please. And another tactic I took was these large sheets. So these are about one and a half meters by um, a meter 20. These large sheets of wax with this graphite sandwich between them, crumpling them up so they almost feel like kind of boulder or a kind of a mountainous um, object like in, in the terrain, a, a kind of, um, I don't know, yeah, a kind of like boulderous um, moraine of ground with these objects kind of peering around and peering out of them. But at the same time, obviously this iconography, this image of the crumpled paper suggests something which is maybe lost, discarded or overlooked, um, which is of course another of the conditions of these artifacts. So next slide, please. So the exhibition is a mixture of these two elements, the hanging and the crumpled um, drawings. And as a viewer, you have to confront these and kind of work your way around them. They offer themselves up quite vulnerably to you as, as a viewer. Next slide, please. And that's just another gallery shot. Next slide, please. So I just want to end by thinking what the value of drawing might be. And to do that, I'm thinking of this quote from Noel Castry, who's asked, thinking about um, contemporary climate science and asking us, almost putting out a plea to look what types of knowledge making outside the scientists might be of use to help us understand um, the world. So how might we understand this crisis of, of glacial melt? And he calls us to look um, to other forms of knowledge including that produced by the arts. Next slide, please. So really that's what I'm thinking. What, what might drawing be able to do? Thinking about drawing as this discipline which makes a mark, leaves a trace. It, it, an image appears through both rubbing things out, through changing things, through marking and through leaving a trace there. So what we're looking at on the screen now are evidence of an experiment that I did this summer in which thinking about these drawings which were made on the wax paper, held shut, vulnerable to heat. These were taken um, into sites in the Swiss Alps. This is at Glacier Montmine in the Valais. And so seeing what would happen if these wax drawings of these glacial artifacts were exposed to the same sun that was melting some of these um, ice patches and sites. Next, next slide, please. So here are these ex experiments exposed to the sun, Swiss sun in, in Switzerland. And there is Regula and Marcel um, having a look at some of these melting, melting drawings. Next slide, please. So the idea was if drawing is something that can record a trace of a presence being there, how might the act of erasure also record the trace of something happening? And so you can see the comparison there of just two hours in the hot Swiss sun, this image of a boot that was found in the Snavlon glacier, how it has melted over two hours. So the drawing is being destroyed here, but at the same time, it kind of holds the material effects of that hot sunny day. We see the evidence of that melt. And while the ice melts away, the drawing is preserved and it keeps within it a kind of material trace of that loss. So the, the thing that I'd like to propose is that drawing might actually be able to be a mechanism for recording this sense of loss. Next slide, which is my last slide, please. So as the writer Rebecca Solnit has said, inside the word emergency is to emerge. From an emergency, new things come forth. In other words, this is a state of change. While the drawing is melting away, the image of that boot is disappearing. Something else is being made apparent and that something else might be the heat of the sun. And while I'm not quite sure yet where this might go or, or what, what will emerge from this, um, I'd like to think that there might be some kind of role for drawing to play to help highlight some of the challenges 
um, faced by glacial archaeologists such as Regula and Marcel. Um, thank you. That's the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was that was wonderful. It's really good to get a, a context for the work and also to see um, some of the artefacts that you've drawn and also um, images of the on-site work and the experimentation. I think it's really particularly interesting that um, the sort of experimentation that we might, as artists, think of as standard in our practice was also, um, I, I, I think, readily accepted by the archaeologists that that you that you worked with, and it wasn't seen as a unusual um, activity at all. And I think that was really interesting and a, and a good example of how drawing um, conducted in the rigorous way that you conduct it actually does bridge over into disciplines like archaeology. So uh, yeah, it's really fascinating to see the, the drawings, artifacts, and also the evidence of the on-site work. Thank you. Um, I think my, my role now is to start asking a couple of questions. And <clears throat> I think I, I, I'll just return um, uh, to um, Marcel. Um, um, Marcel, your, your work involves um, the recovery and analysis of very, very small uh, objects, um, the rock crystal um, uh, specimens. But it also, I gather, um, involves quite a degree of interpretation. You examine these things and then have to imagine that crystal chip as a tool, um, a tool in a hand, a tool in a hand doing something technological. Um, how far can you take that, if you like, transformation or that imagination before you have to say, I don't know, and it's an enigma. You know, I think that's a really quite interesting thing for artists, where you take something that um, you know is a object in the world, and then you 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 begin to rethink it. I, You're on mute. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's well. I think that's the aim of 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 archaeology is to find out the 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 act of something being made and being used and the, and the people to find out about the people behind it and we as i often sit in my office alone and in my lab or and, and look at things and draw things and photograph things and study things under the microscope is really the the collective work of many people that work in archaeology that have worked in archaeology that that i've sort of absorbed and tried to condense into that and um I, whether that be experiments that somebody's made or that i've made or or just general knowledge uh knowledge from from uh practical skills that i might not even have but some of them i do i think you can go quite far, but there is, of course, at some point, there's always a limit of what you know. And uh, in that case, it is actually good to to uh, see also what people like Sarah do with these things, because she does bring a different perspective on it, which is, this might not always be directly going into the science, but it does, it does, it, you can't let that go. It doesn't, it does stick somehow. It, it's, in German, we have the word um, abfärben. It sort of, it colors it a bit. And uh, we might not always focalize that as a scientist, but I think it's, uh, yeah, it was interesting also what she said with the, the, the marking of traces. All these objects are basically traces that people have marked on, on material and, so it's it's not that far away. Maybe that's why it's also not so strange for us archaeologists that she's doing this. Hmm. All right, thank you. Um, and I um, I have a question for regular as well, which is a little bit more sort of general. I think um, 
I imagine artifacts have been emerging from ice patches and glaciers for as long as, as people have been engaging with them. Um, was there, is, there a bit, is there a point at which um, um, these artifacts became archaeology and then this archaeology became sort of climactic? You showed us an image of Utsi. Was that a key moment in, in archaeology becoming climactic? The key moment of um... Maybe consciously noticing that um, that there is glacial archaeology. I think you know there was finds before. We know that under Theodul, the first finds are from the 19th century, and we know that those two other bodies I showed they were found in the 80s, both of them. So it's, but I think Ötzi sort of because it was so spectacular, it basically sort of arrived in everybody's consciousness that maybe we should look more at ice patches. It still didn't happen for another 10, 15 years, a lot. But yeah, that's sort of the moment, the first moment to realize we should really, there is stuff up there and we should look for it. And then with us for the Schneiderjoch, that sort of the first finds there came out in 2003. And then since then we've really looked at our passes, I have to say before that it was not really part of our brief because there's a lot of other stuff to do in our canton there's lots of building activities and yeah you also go up there on these mountains is a bit of an effort every year <laughs> yeah <laughs> so has university training sort of caught up with the advances in in sort of glacial archaeology and has um the kind of public understanding of what's going on um really caught up as well do you i, I gather that um Quite often, uh, a site is is or an artifact is is uncovered or or spotted by a hiker or an alpinist. So, are students now? Do you have um, training for students in in alpine archaeology? And also, do you have really good um, sort of workshops, discussions, exhibitions that are bringing the public in? I must tell you one, does you like? <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can both pitch in. <laughs> but I, I can, I can start because uh, my, my research project has also had a very big outreach aspect, and uh, uh, yeah, we've been going out personally, and with the project, we've been going out more to the, to the general audience than uh, to a scientific community. There's very few people that really engage with this in in Switzerland. This is a very small field. I think is that I don't know if there's if there's ten people in Switzerland that think about this topic regularly. Then it's quite a bit, I would say. Um, so there's not. I think it is. It is also part of university education of, of students, and but at a small small level, it's not the it's, it's not a big priority and. It's also not a large demand of people doing this. Well, maybe we should have more people doing this, but because we are losing sites and we can't doing everything. But uh, I think, yeah, we've been going more out to to the general public than to to our scientific colleagues. Although there is definitely uh, a lot of, of contact, I think, but but in a more informal way. Or well, what do you think, Legula? Yeah, I think we have we take regularly students along with us but that's usually students that um, are interested and want to come along we don't we don't like from our service we have very unit we don't we do commercial archaeology we don't really teach at university but we have students who want to come and then we take them along if they if it's possible mm -hmm. if they're fit enough because it is four hours walk up and three hours down so people have to be a bit used to walking in the mountains mm -hmm. and yeah um, the main aim is really to reach the general public that moves around the mountains because most finds that we have, including those Schneiderjoch finds, were found the first time by hikers. And mm -hmm. that's just, because we just can't check every single ice patch in the Swiss Alps. So we are really reliant on people that get in touch. And I think that does happen in the last few years that has increased. So I think that works throughout outreach. It's not always interesting for us. It's sometimes Second, Center, Second World War um, or military. Uh, even younger stuff, but that doesn't matter. I mean, we can see what it is, and if we think it's not interesting to us, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But we just can't go everywhere, and it's great if people get in touch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, certainly when I visited with Sarah, the exhibition in Annecy 
Um, that was very well attended by the public. Uh, I think that was Pierre Yves' uh, curated exhibition, and there was some of your work in, in that, and that was very well attended. One of the things that um, that struck me when when um, Sarah was talking about preservation, um, um, recording what's lost as well as what's gained. I mean, that struck me that it struck me that. Um, some of the material that your uh, regular and Marcel you're dealing with, some of that material can't be preserved, and some of it perhaps can't even be taken down from the mountain. And do you, do you find that you're making, you're making, are you making judgments about what can be, what can be preserved and what can't be preserved? Sarah talked a little bit, or used the phrase, the politics of of, of kind of preservation, the politics of collecting. Do you make value judgments? Do you make judgments that are just based on the the state of the art, the artifact? Um, so how, how how does that work? When do you, do you try to take everything, or do you, or are you making really quite difficult decisions when you're out on an ice patch? I try to take everything. Mm -hmm. The judgment, the question of judgment, comes more in on um, how do we take it. So. You know, certain things you can just stick in a plastic bag, put in your backpack and walk down with it. But those um, bast fiber objects, they are just so fragile that you have to take them, including the, the rocks underneath. And then in a couple of places, a couple of times we had to then organize a helicopter and that just then gets a bit more expensive and a bit more complicated. And then it also needs a separate budget and you have to go out and talk to bosses so it's more about that. But the thing is, these things are so old or the chance that so, that's one of the problems, of course, when you're out there is that you have no idea how old these things are. You only know that when you have done a C14, a radiocarbon date. So that means that when you stand there and you have this past fiber thing, it, you have no idea how old it is, but it doesn't look familiar, so it's probably old. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it's a judgment. We, we don't really want to decide up there whether it's important or not. We'll do that in the lab. Okay. And then, you know, like that, but then, then the whether it gets um conserved or how well it gets conserved that then might be dependent on how old it is and what it is exactly okay okay a, 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 a slightly playful um follow-up to that then if you're out there and you come across a 1950s toothbrush does that come down with you as well as a you know neolithic um spear uh, that might well come down but it might go in the bin <laughs> 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 if it's too modern and I don't think it's necessary to keep them, I'll, 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 I'll do that judgment because if it goes in our conservation lab, then it gets expensive. You know, just the storage space alone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry, yeah, we have some collect questions with the... from the audience. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to read them out, Anita? No, I, c I can do that, but Marcel okay. was coming in before I interrupted. That's all right. Okay. okay. Um, I think there are, there are a few coming in. So there are some which are... Um, and lots of things about the relationship of art and science and communication. Um, but there are a couple of quite detailed questions, probably for Marcel and Regula, um, which is from one from Claire uh, about the graph at the beginning of the glacier, at the beginning of the presentation, where the glacial level has changed dramatically throughout history. And the question is really, have the glacial levels now retreated further than before? I think they that's have. for you, Marcel. <laughs> they have. Um, yeah, we we now have, uh, well, the, the site that I worked on uh, goes back, uh, the youngest material that we have is 8,000 years ago. And that has just in 2013 come out again. So we know that the ice that we're, that we're losing now is old. So it's going further back than it has done over the past, um, yeah six, eight thousand years. It uh, doesn't mean that there was always, always ice, but it would have been very, it would have been days or maybe weeks that there wasn't ice in that place. So yes, and um, this also means that we're losing sites uh, fast and uh, uh, the sites that we're losing are potentially getting older and older as well. That, that's fantastic. Thanks for clarifying. I mean, I think the photographs really make that evidence really evidential um, and somehow both the graphical information and the photography really helps uh, that understanding. Uh, it's very dramatic um, in, in the images you've shown. 
Um, there's a there's another question which is from Elizabeth, which is about identifying the trees that the wood came from or the animals that the leather came from. And is that something that's possible or has been done uh, in this instance? I think yeah, we have done in. the um, I'm not sure about the leather shoe anymore that I showed you, but I think it's cow hide. But no, we do when we we do analyze also the kinds of wood which you normally can do at least to a species level, maybe even further down. Now we do as much as uh, we can with um, analysis. We've also started doing ancient DNA analysis, but that's only just starting now because the finds that we found in 2003 are, were analyzed and then it didn't work and now we can do another round possibly. That's really um, helpful, thank you. Great clarification about that detail um, and the scientific knowledge that underpins this. Um, there's a question comment from Morag who's made a number of really interesting points in the chat, um, but that question about drawing recording and using drawing as part of finds analysis, which is standard as a, an archaeological practice, so there's a use of drawing that goes between the different practices that we're seeing, and the question is did this make the opportunities for intersections between artistic and scientific drawing greater? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so Sarah, how are we going to work with that? <laughs> well, there's, there's a whole body of literature around drawing and there archaeology. Is. There's the Drawing Stonehenge projects and the Artists in Archaeology project is quite live in, in the UK. Uh, so yeah. it's it's not a, it's certainly not a new thing to be working as an artist alongside archaeologists. But I guess from my perspective, that was the first when I about twelve years ago when I first worked with an archaeologist, Fraser Brown at Oxford Archaeology, it was that shared ground in drawing which enabled a lot of those initial conversations when I was first learning about how archaeology operated that helped. But um, maybe because you've drawn yourself, I think you said to me, oh, spectacles are really difficult to draw. <laughs> like, so you have, a, there's at least some shared appreciation about what it means when you're trying to study these things. Although I think one of the things that I may be drawing is not so much the artifact itself, which is how it feels, it's aura or it's the sense of the thing. So it's almost looking past the material thing itself, but to something that's not seen in it, which is quite a different way of recording. It's not about recording a, the material factness of it. It's about revealing the I don't know, the emotional presence that clings to these artifacts or the traces of what of where that can be seen that might trigger an effect in us. I don't know. It's trying to make visible something that's invisible. Oh, that's very No, I think I think that makes sense. And it's also I think also the very, very good archaeological drawings, which are very, very rare, they do that as well as just showing they, they can do both, I think. And of course they have to be accurate, but even in the accuracy, they, they show something of, of that. But yeah, I think, yeah. I think it is def it, there's definitely a difference, but there's uh, it's an overlap and it's, but that's why it's interesting that more people do different things with different, well, with the same material. I think fantastic. There are lots of other things coming into the chat, but I'm conscious that we're scheduled to finish at 7.15. Oh, yeah. So, Jerry, I don't know if you want to have a a last question and a thumbing up, and then we'll say thank you uh, and announce the next drawing discussion if um, we go from there. There are lots of really great comments, and we'll share those with the panel uh, later. Uh, actually, um, Marcel sort of preempted my my summing up question, and I, I was just going to ask Regina and Marcel, but also Sarah too. You know, what what's the value of these interdisciplinary collaborations, and what does what does archaeologists and science get out of it? And I think we could probably see what Sarah gets out of it, but she can answer the question too very briefly. So Marcel and and Regina, you know, what what does an artist bring to the table? I think, I think a different point of view uh, to, to see objects, yeah, because for us it's often a very analytical way to look at something and 
just to understand how it's made, but it's for me also good to sort of see a different emotional response to find, which I think we have as well as archaeologists, but we're sort of normally in our day-to-day -day life, we try very much to not have it and sort of be scientific and analytical and just think about the questions that we have and how can we answer them. But of course, when, when you also find things in on site for me, that is often moment also when you sort of, when you take your breath away and think, wow, this is so, or, you know, this is so fine. How did they do that? And once you get into details of how it was made, it's also gets emotional because it's really interesting. And you see how hard it is sometimes for us to re recreate something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. What about you, Masa? It's a bit, I haven't had the chance a lot, I have to admit. So it's it's really, really great to have this chance. And I think maybe it needs, it's also something that at the beginning of your career, you're, you're still learning a lot about your actual, your own vocation, your own work. You, at some point you get a bit more accomplished and, and then there's more space for it as well. Mm -hmm. and, and sadly, I think the space, um, or in brackets, time and money, is often also something that plays a role in there that you just don't always have the, the time to, to make space for this, to think about these things. Because it is something that we think about and uh, that you're with colleagues or you, you talk about it, but you don't always have the chance. And then it's good that something like this comes up and it sort of forces you to do that. And that's quite good. And I think it's also interesting because it's it helps you open up a bit to other people that are not archaeologists, which is one is often so much in, in one's own little world and uh, it's it helps to, to open up and I think it'd be good to do a bit more of it. So I think uh, I think Sarah will come to Switzerland again next yeah. year. So we'll that's, that's see where what we happens should end, there. really. Sarah, do you want to briefly tell us what the next step is and what the plans are for the future? <clears throat> Oh, um, as Marcel says, hopefully um, going back to Switzerland um, next summer and continuing this further. And what I, I hope is that maybe the drawing might offer a way to give voice to these artifacts and all the work that, not all the work, but f at least try and complement and find a way to raise awareness of this um, work that's been done, which we don't often hear very much about, which is a really interesting entanglement of the human and the environment and, and climate. Um, and thank you so much, Marcel and Regula, for joining us tonight. It's been wonderful to hear about your work. Um, you. It's been a really fascinating drawing discussion. Can I say, uh, on behalf of everybody here, on behalf of Drawing Projects UK, the biggest thank you to Marcel and Regula for joining us from Bern, to Jerry Davis for convening the session, and of course to Sarah Casey for a compelling exhibition and the, and the opportunity to really focus in depth in the way that artists use drawing in relation to science and other disciplines uh, but particularly here in relation to alpine archaeology it's been a really fantastic session we haven't got through all of the questions and it's been a really interesting audience because i know we've had a mix of artists drawers archaeologists museum people uh, joining us this evening and it's been so fabulous to welcome everybody to what I hope has been a really compelling drawing discussion and we look forward to seeing you all again hopefully on the 15th of December for the next drawing discussion and the speakers will include Faith Stevens who I know is in the audience this evening, uh, Sarah Casey and myself um, but we'll be putting the bookings up for that tomorrow so look forward to seeing you then really beautiful conversation this evening. Thank you so much for such generosity and thank you also to Fiona Cassidy in the background for Drawing Projects UK. Thank you. <laughs>